Hello, hello, hello. Have another hello. Welcome to Spirits of the Fringe. I hope you've been enjoying it so far. We're now on episode six and this week's, well, I say this week's, I think I've given up any uh, idea that it's going to be a weekly podcast. Uh, This episode's guest is Misbehave, known to some as Amy and... I've been hoping to speak with her for some time. She's been travelling the world with her superb game show, which uh, has just sort of taken on a life of its own, really, from something that very much started... Sorry, that's uh, uh, MC Ronnie who's back on the mic this week. Uh, you can also notice I've got another cold, and I'm holding him entirely responsible for that. I had no idea they, they, they incubated so many diseases. Anyway, I've been meaning to get hold of Amy for some time. Uh, her uh, game show really is made of cardboard and uh, gaffer tape, and it's a true thing of beauty. I think I first caught it at Adelaide Fringe, but I've since seen it in London and Edinburgh. It's another one of those that I just take people along to revel in the sheer glee of it. And I think with Amy, her trajectory was always going to be an interesting one uh, with her career. But what's interesting about her, I think, is that she is now doing something that doesn't really involve her main skill set at all. Uh, She's completely eschewed that. She started off as, I believe, a multi-record holding sword swallower and was sort of on the alternative cabaret scene for some time and what I always loved about Amy was her attitude I think it was sword swallowing done with such a laissez-faire blasé attitude and other French adjectives but it was yeah I I remember doing a a, a corporate with her and and there's uh, you know with a corporate I think often there's that desire by certain uh, performers to kind of pander to the audience and to, to 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 really kind of earn that 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 uh, sweet dollar that uh, you're getting, that danger money. But I remember with Amy, she couldn't have given less of a fuck, but went on and was was absolutely uh, brilliant, just tore, tore the roof off. And because of that ballsiness and, and uh, gobbiness, I suppose, she also became a very well-sought-after uh, compare and MC in uh, a field that is still fairly dominated by, by men and more so back in the day. And now, as I say, she's doing her, her game show concept, which has taken her to Vegas. I believe she got asked to do some shows in California, and then naturally she ended up going, let's give this a go and put it on uh, amongst the lights of Vegas. I do hope to go and visit there one day. got uh, quite a few friends out there now who are plying their wares out there, and it really does fascinate me. Uh, actually, technically now I should be packing. I'm off to the States tomorrow, and I'm going to throw a little plug in here because why not uh, in LA and Wisconsin I will be doing some shows you can find those on my website alexistubus.com uh, 10th and 11th of March at the Lyric Hyperion Theatre in LA and then various dates uh, 14th, 15th and 16th I think in Wisconsin I really should know uh, for the Artie Gras Festival but as I say all details on the website and that is the show I'm doing there is a Marcel Lucant's wine list my little improvised piece in character and I've noticed that there is definitely a theme with all the people I've had on so far most of them certainly Martin oh, Ron okay let's play with that there you go easily pleased so yeah there's definitely a theme uh, going on with people such as Trevor Locke Lucy Hopkins and now Amy Misbehave in that their fortunes are pretty much made by the audience and uh, this, uh, I, I guess this is of, of interest to me because that's the show that I've been uh, uh, touring about for the last couple of years and uh, there's something I find really quite fun and sometimes magical about it. Not, not always, I think we've all we've got horror stories there. Anyway, uh, I'll stop warbling, Ronnie probably won't and I will just let you enjoy the interview with Misbehave. Hello. Hello. Uh, we, we finally we found a, um, a a dignified and suitable time for us to uh, both contact one another the other side of the planet. It's uh, nine p.m. here and Vegas time, and it's at uh, one p.m. here Vegas time. Beautiful. Then that's yep. all good. Uh, so yes, you are live from Vegas. I am uh, s- sniffling my way through the British winter. Uh, after contracting another cold from my little eight-month-old uh, bundle of uh, disease. That bundle of disease is correct, I think. You're actually going to be in L.A. in a couple of days, aren't you? 
I right. actually am tantalisingly close to uh, Vegas, but I won't have time for a visit, unfortunately. I'm, I'm fascinated by it. Always have been. I'm now obsessed with Marcel coming to do some stuff at Paris. <laughs> <laughs> One of these days, we will make it happen. But is, is Vegas everything you, you dreamed it would be? Actually, the difference, one of the things um, that is very different that I hadn't realised and it takes you a minute on being here is that actually it's a hustle. Right. It's in bare, you know, bare knuckle fist, like, you name it, hustle. Everywhere you look from um, the showbiz of the strip and the casinos and everything right through to a uh, car mechanic, it's a hustle. And, right. and it's, I mean, one of the things which, of course, makes immediate sense to me now I realise it, but I hadn't realised it is... Um, because it's a transient town, there are a lot of fucking cowboys here, man. Sure. <laughs> you know, so, cause, and of course. And hard like, to build an audience as well, I'd imagine. It takes, uh, what's interesting about this place is it's not so much that it's hard to build an audience, it's that the time is different from elsewhere. So because you're dealing with a four-day week, in a way, the four-day audience, so they come in for four days, they leave, they come in for four days, they leave, it means that word of mouth is not going to be the same speed as it would work in Edinburgh. Like in Edinburgh, you can't really need the word of mouth out by the end of, what, sixth day? You'll get a sort of inkling on the ground. Mm. So, you, so the example, I mean, and so what happened here is when we celebrated our first uh, anniversary here, so we've been playing for a year in Vegas, and uh, I was speaking to a croupier in Bally's, the incredibly glamorous casino I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> How would you describe it? Um, I'd describe it as um, functional. <laughs> in that, in that, um, the Paris is incredibly gaudy uh, and looks like Paris and the Caesars and the Bellagio are very much like wow excess uh, large scale Bally's is quite municipal and so it's cute as all buttons but it's just it doesn't have any it's not got a flamingo or a you know <laughs> so she, what has it got sensible casino she's the sensible casino she doesn't have all this gaudy shit around her you know <laughs> so does that mean you sort of attract a more serious kind of gambler who's 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 not swayed by massive flamingos or uh, pyramids or an Eiffel Tower? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <what a> show. <laughs> no, because what you do, I would say that the um, flamingo, the Paris, and Harrah's. So Piff is playing in flamingo. Tape Face is playing in Harrah's. I'm playing in Bally's, and you've also got the Paris. They all feel similar in price and clientele. So right. they are. Yeah, so I'd say they are, it's kind of, it's the working class, middle class hotels. So how big's your venue out there? That's the thing. I mean, what the, the way the showrooms work in Vegas is they vary in size from a 60-seater, no, there's no 60, from, from like a 100-seater through to 3,000, right? Um, I'm in a small showroom, so I'm mine holds 180, similar again, similar to Sam, I think, I think, Piff might be 250. But oh, okay. So, so you have sort of, it, it's quite, um, it would be very, fam- this, the whole setup here would be quite familiar to anybody once they lose all the dressing, anyone who's done fringe festivals. Because what you realize is you get, there's an element of never ending fringe. And people are just coming in, they're here to be entertained, come, and you're, you're fighting for them in the sense that they may not want to go and see a show. They've got other things they want to do there, but they are there to be Vegas. So these people keep coming in, and then you've got the kind of different size of shows. So you've got the Celine Dion's, the Elton John's, and all of that stuff. Then you've got the Cirque du Soleil's. Um, then you've got the kind of large-scale variety shows like V for Variety or Absinthe or what have you, which are playing to kind of 700. Then you've got the sure. big and the big name comics, you know what I mean? So like Carrot Top here. Carrot Top, yeah, I love that he's got a residency there. <laughs> he's really, really good. <laughs> I my tits off. <laughs> Two things happened when I went to Carrot Top. One was I went, holy shit, I'm finding this very funny. Mm. And then one was like, oh my god, I, I just, I just didn't know you were allowed to, allowed to do that. <laughs> you know, because it's like, I mean, my favourite acts of all time are Woody Bot Muddy, um, yes. Raymond and Mr Timkins, Ivan Brackenbury. I know my, I love, there's a certain style of sort of nutty, ridiculous with Stupid music. Stupid prop based. Yeah. But all of them have. Uh, for want of a better word, there is quite a clear, <laughs> I want to say backstory, but it's the wrong word. You, yeah, um, Raison d'etre. Theme, yes, something. I, I have no, and, and what the thing with Carrot Top is there's no link. So <laughs> that's really, and, and, and I'm not saying this is an insult to him. I mean, what I blew my mind was I watched a man 
entertained me for 70 minutes with no, it was a bit like, I guess, Family Guy. No link, no sec, you know, no secretary, just bang, bang, bang. And it would be whether it's a musical sting, um, a one liner, a visual gag, a very short anecdote, a punt, you know, a right. setup line. And there's no link to any of them. But it, yeah. I was entertained. So I went, okay, wow, I did not know this was allowed. The world is my yeah. own. Ah. There's, a, there's a lovely little carrot tops uh, anecdote courtesy of Martin Soane in a, a previous podcast so if anyone uh, wants to check that out that's a couple of podcasts back All lovely I little tale is I want to know what Martin Soane's and carrot top did together because it involves was... nudity Ah, of course it is. Yeah, Very. that's all I'll say. You can go and uh, uh, source it for yourself. But you, the, the people that you speak of, it's, it's interesting because um, you and the other two, so uh, Piff the Magic Dragon and uh, Sam doing uh, Tape Face, what links you three is that these are shows in glitzy, glamorous Vegas, which are basically held together with gaffer tape and cardboard. You know, you've got Piff in a, in a crap dragon suit. Mm-hmm. You've got Sam that just uses the most base oven gloves and, and gaffer tape. And you, yours is, is pretty much stitched together with tape and cardboard. We've got stitching now. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting one. So firstly, and again, this is why I was saying to people, you know, fringe regulars. So after the first year, I was speaking to a crew PA in Bally's. And I said, hey, we just celebrated our first year. And he turned to me and he said, congratulations on your first trimester. (laughs) So there's an element where because of the comings and goings of people, the transient nature of the town, and because shows do not last, you know, we have outlasted quite a lot of fucking large productions. And you just go, Jesus, I just watched someone throw five million at a wall and it disappeared in Mm. three weeks, you know. So, So there is an element that the word of mouth does work, but it just takes time. Our audience now is pretty much people who have been told by their friends that when they come to Vegas, come and see us. Because right. we, and I learned this, I learned this two days ago, we have got literally a marketing budget of zero. Like as in no money is being spent on marketing. So unless, unless I have pitched them, they, or they've, they've usually read, read a review on TripAdvisor because that's sort of how America books. Really and, interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because and, and I tried this as well, having a staycation on the strip one time. I was like, I'm just curious to know what the, the experience is like. So I stayed at the Flamingo. Um, it wasn't a suite, so there is an element of the rooms where they almost repel you out. Hmm. Um, I'm on the floor. I'm not a gambler. So I'm looking around. I'm going, well, what shall I do? And nothing is helping me decide. You know what I mean? So I was like, well, right. what, where should I look then? So I then go online and I think, what exactly am I going to, am I going to Google? And that's how people end up at Terrific Well, So you say it's a hustle, but are people out there, do you go out there flyering or spruiking, as they say in Australia? Do you have to go out there with pictures of your face like you do at a fringe festival to try and get punters in? What's interesting, and again, I think Sam and uh, John are a good one to talk to about this as well, but is, is uh, the answer is a bunch of stuff you can do. Is flyering efficient? Not at my level. Like I right. could, like I could fly for twenty hours a day and probably get one person, maybe, because again, and and the same for me. I I have never in in Vegas. You just I wouldn't bother taking a, a flyer, which would then translate in me going into that venue to find the box office to actually buy a ticket to actually then find the the showroom and go and see the show. There's just so many actions required. It's just so I think that the flyer is largely there for almost recognition sake. So maybe you've seen a poster, you see a flyer on the floor. And you go into the casino you're in, and that show that you've seen a poster and a flyer on the floor for is there. That mm. might take you going, but I personally don't believe the flyering works in this setting. I think because well, yeah. And, and, yeah, another thing about Vegas is is that it seems to me to be very Route One. It seems to be very sort of not no no well no nonsense I suppose, but you know you you look at your posters and and your your publicity images, and you've got this woman in a gold lame suit. There's glitter, there's sparkles, but then you look closer and there's a <laughs> There's a mobile phone embedded in her head with blood seeping out of it. You know, do they, would, would they even go for the subversive <laughs> um, look you're, you're portraying? Well, two things. One is, strangely, we're not using that image. <laughs> Fun, all right. Yeah, funny that. <laughs> I was really surprised when I used that image in Edinburgh. So basically, it's me with an iPhone smacked into my forehead with a bunch of blood bleeding down while I'm taking a selfie, <laughs> right? Great image. And why I, I wanted to put that image together was because I... Um, you know that theory that uh, it's, what is it, sex, death, and what's the other one? Taxes. No, sex and death. Just sex and death, isn't it? Right. 
in terms of what grips people in, I want to say them in entertainment, I mean, like across the board, you know, live and on the telly and stuff, if you boil it down, sex or death. Yeah, sure. I've, I've been doing sex for ages. Like, I've been wearing the red rubber and da da da, da and I'm not <laughs> sexy, and it's not my raison d'etre. So what about if I try and make this really, you know, hit the same way? And will I will I sell more tickets? And it didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was the best poster of Edinburgh, and it resulted in absolutely uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> that is a tragic shame. Um, but but also your um, I mean, there's the old adage that uh, Americans don't get sarcasm, and your show is pretty much built on sarcasm. So is, has that been a factor as well? Have people got you out there? Mm, it's a very well, that's a very well put question. I would say that um, the adage is a bit cruel and, sure, and Americans can get sarcasm. That said, I think in the same way the Esco, Eskimos have 40 words for snow, I think we've got nuance with sarcasm that is sort of not an art form, but is a cultural um part of whom what we are so we've got 40 different words for sarcasm and yeah. they they know three of them yeah. and it's a very uh, british show this with its sensibilities i think yeah and i think it, which is why the idea that it is surviving over here is fascinating to me because i can you know new york is a different place is di- you know, different sensibility and actually the east coast west coast different sensibilities but vegas somebody said this brilliant thing last night did they say hang on they said the thing about vegas is it's opposite from wherever you're from, wherever you've come from. Right. That's, it was actually, it was, it was the best Trump impersonator I've ever seen said it. <laughs> Doing about Vegas, you know, and it's, it's, it's opposite from wherever you have come from. And, <laughs> and that's the thing. So there's, it's, it's literally been put together uh, for gambling, sex, entertainment. And, and death. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. So, and because, you know, what's weird more, I think, sorry, I'm waffling. I think the reason um, it does work here now, bizarrely, is actually the modifications I made to it once Trump and Brexit happened. Of so course. for me, me, the fact that it's now, there is a driving point throughout, which is, yeah, for sure, thing for yourself and all the rest of it, but it's also be nice to each other. And not doing it patronizing, it's not fucking children's theater, none of that. But it's, it's, there is an underlying message of, come on, you fucking idiots, we're all the same. Well, yeah, the underlying message I've always got from it is basically, fuck it. Is, yeah. is, is is that's that's it's it's if you well what's what's what was the actual um slogan it was don't ask don't get wasn't it, it was the original well i've got i mean that, and that's still there so the the Great. terms and conditions are still are still the same think for yourself you don't ask don't get use your initiative nothing means anything life's not fair and i don't make the rules Great. That's... and so these are all up in cardboard on the stage yeah as the it's... tenets of the show yes yeah and it takes them, what, what I've found, and I don't think this is necessarily about them being American, I think it's about the setting, which is the Strip and Vegas, uh, and what a Vegas audience understand and all the rest of it. But is, it takes them longer than uh, the Brits to figure out you can don't ask, don't get. So I've got little tricks I've found to help them understand that more. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. But so it's just, and once... I mean, people are people, which is quite funny. So I've done this around the world now, and there is actually, if you take a group of people, within that group of people, there will be the doubter, the questioner, the exhibitionist, hmm. the uh, leader, the wannabe leader, the annoying person, the quiet person, the person that likes watching. They, all, they exist wherever we go, and the dials go up and down. So if you... which can It's quite, kind of heartening, really, isn't it? It's very heartening. It's very heartening, and it's, it's why it's quite a joyous social experiment for me. You know, because you just kind of go, oh, no, no, this is actually human. Um, yeah, well, but, I mean, at the same time, you, you talk about Trump and Brexit, and yours is a very divisive show by its nature. So, I mean, for the minute you go in, you are divided. You're in two teams. It's, do you still do it like that, the, the <laughs> iPhone yeah. holders and the non-iPhone holders? Yeah, but you're divided by something. I mean, basically, you know, the first bit is so, a... The first thing I say, and we're going to be playing a lot of games for a lot of games for a lot of points. So what do points mean? And someone goes nothing. I go correct. So you're getting the <laughs> points of the evening, and you just think we somewhere we understand it's sort of based on us. Uh, you, you, yes, it's divisive, but it's divisive on such an arbitrary point, as in yeah, I lethal think, nihilism is what I describe yeah, it as. Exactly, and it's like um, you, you're separated by two teams depending on your phones. But you know, if you're sitting in the wrong seat, it's fine. We accept cheating. So. Do you ever get any people that don't have phones and like <laughs> have to sit yeah. on the floor? 
Many, but we don't make them sit on the floor. Fine. They're, they're usually elder. <laughs> right. Yeah, fair. <laughs> um, pride of place. Uh, but but um, so, yeah, just try and describe the show to someone who hasn't seen it before. I mean, without giving too much away, what are some of the elements of the show? So it's basically, it's a, it's a game show, and I suppose one could put quote marks around that. Um, you come into a room, wherever we are, with cardboard signs all over the walls, um, with varying things from anything from don't ask, don't get, through to um, this is a really bad sign, etc. They're sort of silly, funny signs. Um, I div- There's two sort of sides of chairs, so you divide them based on their phones. You've got iPhones on one side, everybody else on the other. And then we basically play some very silly games that are I've written on cardboard that range from phone-based, like dial my number quickest, to puns, uh, like is it? Oh, that's not. Is it? Is this the rhetorical round? Is not a pun. Wow. <laughs> but it's silly. Um, it's still a lovely bit of wordplay. <laughs> but so they're silly, funny. Um, some of them mean something, and some of them don't. Yeah. I've I've been really enjoying this game. I, I mean, it's such a silly throwaway gag more than a game where you go, and it's now time to play. Who wants to be a millionaire? But the setup for it now that I love is I go, hey, everybody, the economy's fucked. And because of, you know, how crowd psychology works, they all go, yay. (laughs) 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 And then you allow them one beat to realize that's not a yay. And then you go, so it's now time to play. Who wants to be a millionaire? So you end up. And anyway, they play silly games. They accrue a bunch of points that largely don't mean anything because we can take them away and put them in. And it's basically me training them to be two teams, meaning you have one really loud guy but they're going to get nothing because mm. it was just one really loud guy. And you're like, sit your fucking privilege down, mate. It's oh, not totally. I you remember know? seeing it uh, in, its, in its infancy in Adelaide and, uh, and and them getting a little bit kind of, you know, above their station, like someone someone from one team going, can I have a point? And you going, of course you can. You you ask, you ask, you don't ask, you don't get. And then yeah. some bloke going, can I have 20 points? Nope, cheeky. No, nope. and you took it and you took points off. <laughs> I've lovely. now got a really nice thing, which again for me is uh, Brexit and Trump, I find quite prevalent where – Someone will do exactly that. Like, Can we have 20 points? And I'll go, greedy bastard. But a reasonable thing to ask. Don't ask, don't get. So what we're going to do is we're going to decide this the fairest way human beings have worked out to decide this sort of thing so far. Should they get 20 points? And then everybody shouts. And whoever shouts, so they shout for a bit. Whichever one is more persuasive gets it. So I go, yes, you get those points. Now, just to explain okay. why they got points, they got them because they wanted them more than you didn't want them to have them. Imagine <laughs> if this meant something. What I'm saying is, go out. Because <laughs> <laughs> that thing of like, you can fucking stay as quiet as you want, bitch. You're still in the same fucking room as the rest of us. And that's the problem. You can, it, it, you know, it, metaphor for life at the moment is going, you can bitch and moan, but if you don't get up and do action, you really want to maybe have a start questioning why you're bitching and moaning. You're not sure. doing it. And yeah. on the flip side, like, what's, what's the furthest someone's uh, gone to get points? Wow. I mean, okay, so, well, here they are tamer and the uh, nudity laws are stricter. I say that uh, <laughs> a variety of things happened in the past. Um, <laughs> I One of my favorites was at even earlier doors in Adelaide. It's when I was playing in the bookshop with Bob. Oh, yeah. Um, and a dude... Uh, this is in Edinburgh, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a dude jumped up and was, wanted to bribe us with a credit card. And I said, I haven't got a fucking ATM. Go, there's one five minutes down the road. He left. We forgot about him, and he came back, and we hadn't realized it was pissing with rain. So he came back absolutely Edinburgh drenched uh, with a big bouquet of flowers, a big box of chocolates, and 50 quid. <laughs> and it's to say he got some points on that. <laughs> I would hope so. You'd, be, you'd have to be quite churlish to uh, turn that down. But we also had an acrobat. Um, in a, this was again in Edinburgh because again you get such a lovely range in Edinburgh yeah. but an acrobat jumped up on stage uh, threw all of his clothes off down to Penai did a back <laughs> and then jumped into the splits and I'm like that's <laughs> right but then no because a lady from the other side who was not an acrobat she jumped up on stage ripped her shirt open right chipped, and she chested him off the stage with her bare hip and I was like well he is getting a point but she's getting a five <laughs> I'm straight <laughs> oh that's great and so you it's 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 almost therapeutic it must be for um, a large number of the audience i suppose get to get them out of their shell and uh yeah to I get them the, again i think this i think the real reason that i can get away with doing this and i think that it is fun for both watchers participants and me 
is because of the you don't have to. Like, it's one of the hardest things to explain to press when we're doing a season somewhere is to, to get rid of the fear I would have if I thought I had to be involved. Like, right. so if I was going to tape the show, everything I understand about tape face, but I've never seen him, I would sit in the back row. Mm -hmm. Just so it's as inconvenient for him as possible to drag me up on stage. Because I don't think that Sam, I think Sam uses uh, volunteers well, uh, but there is no uh, question in it. You, you know what I mean? And it's it's sure. And I think that good volunteer work is, is brilliant, but it's not my preference or area. I'll, I'll do a little bit of it when I'm emceeing, but it's more crowd work than it is, here's a routine I'm doing with a person. Because my idea of genuine hell would be being dragged up to do that. I've managed to avoid it through my entire career apart from once on the street. And, um, and it's just not my cup of tea. So I want to feel safe knowing that's not the case. So because you don't have to do anything, because... It is correct if you're just on the phone. It's correct if you're just watching. And it's correct yes. if you're not naked. All are correct. You kind of, <laughs> because of that, I think that's what gets people out of their shells. Because what a classic for me is the last game, which offsets however well one team has or hasn't done, because it's, you know, you win however many points will mean that it just doesn't matter and it's only down to this game. It's down a pint. And what, you, what often happens, and this is <laughs> gloriously universal, like hmm. Brit, Braille, you name it, is that's the one where there'll be a couple of hetero guys who I haven't won. I've won over, but are just still sitting there, you know, arms folded, kind of amused and not engaged. Yeah. And it's now time to play down a pint without a second thought. Bang, stand up. That's okay. You know, and it's just, it's a really interesting little, now if I'd gone and you get up and do that, nah. And if, if someone doesn't want it, I mean, we've got a game called push the red button and, and with Vegas, let's just say, let's say it's a, hypothetical Wednesday hmm. in hypothetical real old people season here and our youngest member is 50. So, cause we've had that where we are staring out to sort of, uh, you know, 60, 50 to 90 year olds. Wow. And you're playing push the red button. So you hold up the sign and it involves people moving and no one wants to move that day. So there's still, because of the f uh, flexibility of the show and because nobody has to do anything and because it also nothing means anything, but it does, but it doesn't then what, what I can do is I can play off that beat. Yeah, of course. Which is, for, for comedy, is really lovely to have that trap door as well. Again, it doesn't matter what happens here, there's a response. So you've got your categories, you've got your show. Do you, in your mind, think oh, it's going to be this, then this, then this, then this for this show? Or do you purely go leap off from the, from the first one and go, right, okay, now we're going here, now we're going here? Is it basically, in your, are you having to juggle <laughs> like the show in your mind, how it's going to pan out every five minutes or so? I have to be present. I can edit as I go, but what has definitely happened since doing um, this for the last year and a half, uh, maybe two years here, just the five day a week, means that what I do is I'll have, um, here's the set list. I put my set, stack my cardboard signs yeah. on my cardboard box. And what I'll do is I'll edit. So as, a, as opposed to jumping from here to here to see what happens. Okay. Now, but I can, because what I've got the freedom of is ad-libbing and working off the crowd. And Absolutely. With them in that moment. So if suddenly we actually end up having a really fun, chatty bit. Then I can drop these three games because actually it's not going to serve them because they're not, they're not really in singing mood tonight, so they'd rather watch, so I'll drop this bit, and et cetera. What I want to do is I actually want to get it here, get it to a point where I've got three options of a show that only me and Tiffany can communicate and do on the fly. Oh, I've yes, got, you have a yeah. Tiffany now. You, you once had a Harriet, the wonderful do, yeah. uh, Harry Clayton, right? Absolutely, and now I have the wonderful Brett Fister, who I am. Um, oh, he is uh, wonderful. He is. And, what a flexible and, man. So flexible, so fucking funny. He's the only <laughs> realist I ever met who wants to be a sitcom writer. You know what I mean? That's great. He is, he is an excellent, funny person. But um, what was the bit I was waffling on about? No, sorry, gone. sorry. Sorry, yeah. no, me, I waffle like a motherfucker. You were talking about the flow of it and, the, and, and um, uh, editing on the fly. Yeah, so well, we've got a section, which is it's one of my favourite bits to do, which is Vegas on a budget. So I basically go... You know, we close the curtains in front uh, behind me, and then I just talk. You know, you know, mano y mano to the audience, <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> but just kind of say, you know, uh, thanks for coming in. We know we've made you work really hard, but we also know you're in Vegas, so we want to give you a last Vegas experience. Do you want one? They go, yeah, that we can afford. 
fantastic because it's now time for Vegas on a budget. And then we have a little, well, a large piece of cardboard with enough of the Vegas strip built on it. And then we just, it's quite, it's, so it's visual. And what we're basically doing is lampooning Vegas in a way they can understand whether they are a local or have just come in that day. Uh, and I believe that that is extendable. And what I would like to do is have a 15 minute version of that. Oh, so lovely. That, so if five minutes into the show, I go, man, they, they just want to sit and watch something tonight. Fair enough. Let's make this even easier for them and us. Okay, I'll drop these games and we'll get, that means we'll do the 15 minute version and we can, I can put to do that on the fly. So there's a game, you know, Shout Loudest is a fun game, particularly <laughs> 600 people. You <laughs> the games up. Shout Loudest. But it's, that's a fun game to play when you're in the debating hall in Edinburgh. Sure. At o'clock at night. Is it a fun game to play for the duration that we would normally play it if it's Wednesday at eight o'clock mm. and you're 50 to 90 years old? Totally. And so what I've got is I've got a way of doing that where that's a 10 second game normally. I can make that a two second game. And it, so it's, yeah, so it's less jumping in different directions because they don't need it and it's creating additional ob- obstacles for me. Whereas editing, definitely. And so that keeps, what, it keeps it fresh. I mean, that's cool. You have to play what's in front of you. No. So you, so you have that, you have them stacked up going, this is how, this is how the show should go. Mm. But it, of course it will never go entirely that way. Yeah. And then what's the, so what's what's the least and the most number of people you've done it to? Oh, uh, most most is I think seven or eight hundred. Wow! And and what that's taught me is I know I can do. I I, I think I could I could scale that up. Mm. And I you you would just change things slightly, but I I, I could see that would be quite a fun game to play with five thousand people. It would just become a different style mm. of game, and you'd have different bits to make sure that was fun for everybody Mm -hmm. Um, and the least oh my god the least i've played to has been yeah let's go there 16 oh wow really where was that here oh in vegas okay just starting out in vegas what was that last week (laughs) no it wasn't last week but vegas back to the sort of nature of um this endless fringe is it it has random months so you know how people like yeah it's the christmas season corporate Mm. no 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 so Randomly, all of the concrete conventions happen in March. <laughs> and, and concrete people don't like going to see shows. <laughs> there's, a tech, there's a tech week that happens in January, um, and no techs go to see shows. Did Chinese come in uh, over the new year, so they actually do come and see shows, but for an English-speaking show, they'll come and mm. sit. Watch it going, what the fuck am I watching? I don't understand a word of it. Take face cleans up on Chinese week, I imagine. Yeah. And then you've got, uh, so, but you know what I mean? So it has these different pot and pockets and patterns. So actually, August is a shitty month in, in Vegas because it's just so hot. So getting a small house is part and parcel of playing Vegas. And I, to, the, to the point, and I would say it's like having gone to see enough Cirque shows. Now, Cirque's uh, Zoomanity holds 2,500. And I've gone mm-hmm. to see where there were 300 in. It's okay. a start show where, in a way, nothing has to change if it's a smaller house. No, of course not. Whereas you, it's on the fly throughout, isn't it? I mean, they always say about, um, uh, so like a really good jazz musician will be able to go with the flow and be able to improvise, but that only comes from years and years and years and years of practice to, 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 to do it in the moment. And I would say it's like the same with you, yeah. surely. Like you've well, done your time, you've, you've done your street performing, you've done, you know, back rooms of bars, you've done sort of Spiegel tents around the world. You've sort of done it all really, haven't you? And that's kind of got you to this point. Yes, but, but, but that's not what made me able to do to a play to 16 people. I mean, this was a real revelation for me. So I think that happened when we'd been here about seven or eight months, you know, sort of a fair chunk into it. And um, when I was a street performer, I was always shit. I or not. I, I had a specific style of pitch I could play. So I was not a big pitch girl. I was more of a corner girl. And I was much better at doing a 15 minute show that would roll through to half an hour if it did. Whereas those big circle shows, I always fucked up. I never, I only ever died on the West Piazza in Covent Garden. Never managed to pull off a decent, proper, that's how you hold a crowd show. With my show show. But I mean, you know, comics well, say died. You, you, were a, you were a sword swallower. So, I mean, yeah. when you die, I assume it comes close to actual death. Pretty much. But it was the swords were going down, right? It was just the uh, um, rest of it. 
And what I've, there was, there's a technique in Covent Garden, which I was always admiring of, but was never able to do. And I call it, I called it a skinny line. So you've got, you've started your show, you're doing your build, you're standing on the pitch. They're all sort of milling around. Some of them are stopping and watching, but you haven't asked any action of them yet. And a good street performer who uses their mouth, like if you're silent, it's a different bag. They will ask a small section. It can be two, three, five, ten people to come off the step, take a step forward and form a line. And then what they do is they hide behind that line, um, whether it's two, four, ten, whatever, and they'll get that line to make a load of noise to help do the clap mm. and cheer for people to get it. And it's a really it's a classic. There you can see it right in front of you technique. And I could never do it because I just, oh, because I was too proud. I mean, I, I, could, I could never do it. <laughs> I just couldn't. <laughs> and um, here, I've had to. Right. I cannot play that show to 16 people without bashing all the fucking pride out of yourself. And it was That's a funny. Lot. Yeah. And so at this a, stage of the career, you've learned the basics. Yeah. <laughs> and and what it was is because I think, and this is the cynic and the kind of whatever cynical old bitch in me, but is I guess it's probably still even a protective device, but any back room or corner of a street or situation, you can play <clears throat> what's actually happening. But if I'm here with 16 people who don't really understand what the show's about anyway, and I, I can't be uh, derogatory about it, I can't be deprecatory about it, I actually have to go, yay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Amy's Little Art no. Club. Woohoo, I'm five and I'm at nursery and the parents are going to clap in a minute. <laughs> Not my jam. Not what <laughs> business. I'm in hospitality. I'm just here to facilitate a good time. So what I want to do is I want to walk on and go, yo, guys, this is what's happened. This is basically pitch. Let's all have a shot. I'll do a couple of acts. He'll do a couple of acts. We'll call it a night. Good night. But I can't do that. And so it was literally my, yeah, it was the last bastion of... Um... <laughs> have you found that quite humbling then? Very much so. And also quite liberating. Okay. Because you're already on the back foot, I would say, culturally out there, I imagine, yeah. for, the, for, the first, for the first few weeks or months that, you, that, that you're out there, as, as I say, sort of trying to get those very British sensibilities and the, and, and the sarcasm out there and get them to buy it. Yeah. But overall, have you, have you, do you think you have won quite a lot more people over out there that didn't quite get the concept of the show at the start and came out really enjoying it? I know people enjoyed it from the get-go. I think I'm very lucky with this show that, you know, provide it. But what a small audience has given me is a different um, path with it, an option for me whenever, and that's transferable. And that is, um, it's the chatty show. So I'll turn to Tiffany and I'll be like, oh, it's a chatty one tonight. Mm. Which means that we just put more breath in between everything, which means instead of me consistently talking to you and expecting a response from you of the words I've just said, teacher style almost. Mm. Now I'm saying something, having faith in the fact that I find this funny and giving it breath so that if all you're doing collectively is watching, that's fine. You're still watching something that's entertaining. You could go yeah. carry all this and actually you are laughing. And to access that then allows them to get more chatty because there's not an energy expected of them. And then we get more chatty, so we get really silly and funny. And, and some of our best shows now would be what I would call the chatty show. Sure. So it's, it's actually it's a blessing in disguise, and, you know, there's always, it's always a grain of gold or whatever after a... <laughs> well, yeah, because I saw it in the early days, and it's in its sort of fairly, fairly early inception in Adelaide Fringe, and um, it, no one else could, could do that show. It's, it was from the start, it was your show. Like, you've got... Uh, yeah. it's, you are catty, you are sarcastic, you are bitchy, but you everyone feels safe in there, and everyone enjoys your company and knows they're not going to get... They, they won't be the brunt of that yeah. wrath unless they're a dickhead. Yeah, and even then, and I think this is also Vegas training because in um, Adelaide or in fringes, the, and the absolute joy of a fringe is um, the freedom. Whereas mm. I, and I mean, I could, if I wanted to, I, I technically have the creative freedom. I could stand on stage and say the word cunt for an hour, but the um, hospitality and pro and respect person in me would never do that. So I'm going to play this room, which has made me, um, yeah, I, th I think more, more wanting to look after them 
than take a risk. I could, I would love to talk politics at the moment. Just, just the news of the day stuff mm. would be so great. But you, they're just, they're not engaged enough. So the closest I can get to is going, you know, in the pre-show, saying things like, uh, "So which stone has been in the news more recently, Sharon or Roger?" You know, and I, <laughs> if, ten, if ten people shout out Roger, I know that I pepper things. We've got a game yeah. called to and Vegas. So really, what? Sorry. Born, I'll admit to. It's just yes, people shouting out different, you know. But um, Vegas audiences tend to be, I would say, Republican heavy, not Democrat. Uh, we do get a diverse audience. So we get gays, straights, people of color, you name it, which not many shows do, actually. Um, Why do you think yours attracts that? I think that's over time it has. And I, uh, I think, again, that's the word of mouth. But word of mouth takes over a year here because... People have to have come and seen the show, had a good experience, left, told some friends they've had a good time. Their friends have then come to Vegas and maybe seen it. Then they've come back and said, that was really good, great. Mm. Then they come back to Vegas and come back and see it, sort of thing. But I think that's, that, that comes under the sort of the, the, the fuck it ethos, I suppose, that it is just so inclusive. It's, it's, it's fuck it to everything, and it's like it's yeah. fuck it to everyone. It's, 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 um, yeah, it's a wonderful thing. We're all a bunch of cunts. <laughs> no, it's not. I mean, it's not. It's we're all a bunch of cunts. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Exactly. So. <laughs> One of the things I've always loved, and it, it because again, so I think with the sarcasm, I think the reason they get it is because again they're not being judged. So it's whether you understand it or not. If you don't understand it, we're not going to make you feel shitty for not understanding it either. And so you slowly get the sensibility. So again, back to um, a group of people always having the same roles within it the person who is actually really gobby who says quite funny think outside the boxy things is often not if you looked at them not the person you would think would be that person so mm. the is straight looking um 60 year old wife of a republican guy is suddenly mm. shouting out in the clever area all the way through and you're like you've just bided your time and now you're finding this amusing and this is actually how your brain works right Oh, you're a per- you know this is a type of person. It's great. So I was One doing of- this for however many years. Like when did you first start doing this? Oh, uh, so I I mean, and the reason I did put this together was because I was just for two reasons. I was sick of um, I burnt out from doing the same thing every night. I yeah. couldn't the the type fives anymore. Um, well, definitely not for a while. And I didn't understand why non fourth wall entertainment wasn't using wasn't allowing cell phone um phones. Because I thought that we've changed. We have changed as a species at the moment. We are currently a different thing than we used to be. That is noticeable. We are not pretending we're theatre. We're talking to you. We're playing with you. So why the fuck does the MC say, put your phone away, you bunch of fuckers, mm. and walks off stage and gets on his? Fuck you. I mean, there's, there's, although there's an incredible uh, story, I think it was from the States. Of, did you hear about this one of, of the guy um, getting up to plug his phone in to a bit of the set in the... <laughs> In a theatre show. And also, but also in the same way, I've got no issue, you know, the odd story of, I um, can't remember which one it was, it might have been Judy Dench, uh, but people stopping the performance going, oi, I'm on the, you know, get off the fucking yeah. phone, I'm doing this soliloquy. <laughs> I'm not saying, it's the same as a conversation I had with Erlokan about hecklers, right? He is vehemently disagrees that hecklers should, he, he doesn't like them. I love them. And um, hmm. I said, but they shouldn't heckle your act. Your act is not an act one should heckle. No. It's, it's, it's not designed. Same with a, a theatre show. So in a way, I mean, be reasonable, <laughs> have, have a respect for where you're at, but that respect has got to be earned. And there's this bizarre um, belief, I feel, in live entertainment where it's like, it's, a, it's like me out taking the piss, you know, it's the sacred space, the sacred <laughs> space. Who? Oh, for you, you bunch of idiots. And <laughs> oh, it's not fucking sacred for them. You told them to get off their phone, so they left and they've gone to a disco where they can listen to music, watch a video, get a drink, chat to a mate, and be on their phone. Fuck off, you've lost them. And if you don't think that can disappear, look at the printed press. That's going to disappear. It's going to actually physically disappear in my lifetime. So why shouldn't live entertainment be under that same scrutiny and it's, it's willfully <laughs> not embracing a thing that is kind of a leveller. I mean, but I conversely, like... is there not a time and a place where you actually, you, you want there to be that space where you can, you can sit down and just immerse yourself in something without some, the, f- the glare of some dickhead's phone? Yes. 
And and if that's the case, and if that's what you want, then you have to get clever and creative from a hospitality and environment user experience point of view to ensure that. And that could be anything from uh, having to relinquish your phone at the beginning to having a moment where things can get used, but something where you integrate it so people go, oh, because this is how we live. We are on our phones. People need to have a journey and a connection with that part of their limb because <laughs> it's there. So I'm not saying it's always um, – I'm not saying they, people should be able to willy-nilly, but you do need to just consider it. And if you are running a late-night – you're running a late-night lineup show of anything where the performers are addressing the audience and alcohol is being served, I would argue they should probably just be allowed to have their phones out. But you would want performers who are on stage that can be funny and quick enough about that. That said, when you caught that level of, um, let's say, insouciance, shall we, uh, surely uh, you must be setting yourself up for a fall on some nights. Like, has there ever been a limit that's been reached where you've gone, oh, OK, hang on, this is too much from an audience? No. The okay. One- <laughs> I've, I've had some fucking bombs of shows. You know, I mean, I've died on my ass. I've had it where me, they hate me, and we have just not had fun at all that night. We've got through it. Hmm. I've done it in the courtesy of shaving it down so we all get through it as quickly as possible. Um, and I'm not a cunt anymore while hmm. it's happening. <laughs> but, uh, and so I've had some stinkers, don't get me wrong. And we'll always, I think, because collectively, if you've got a room of 500 people, there is a chance... I. From a, what you, from a probability point of view, there's always going to be someone who, it, there's going to be enough exhibitionists there and <laughs> rousers. But if you've got a room of 60, there are some nights when actually there aren't any. So it's my job to adapt to that. But outside of that, it's not, it's because it's uh, endlessly adaptable in that respect, that's my job in that moment. I have lost control of the room once. <laughs> got it on video. Oh, there brilliant. Was- <laughs> and, it, and I didn't realise until I watched the video back. It was in London, <laughs> South Bank, in Spiegel Tent. Oh, really? Full up, Friday night. Uh, I think it's like 11 o'clock show or 10.30 show. So I think, I think I sent people to that show. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I did quite a few at that time. Slot, but pissed up people on a Friday night at 11. Yeah. I've been drinking a lot. So I'm pissed on tequila. They're pissed on whatever. And I see this moment where the room tips. So I'm watching this back on video. <laughs> And you see the room tip, and it's a beat away from being a chaotic, not exactly riot, uh-huh. complete, uh, just, yeah, collapse. <laughs> and what I, what I did is I went over to the iPad, <laughs> and for some reason, I put on a Prisoner Cell Block H theme tune. <laughs> Give me roses. And I used to play at about 3 a.m., 4 a.m. on Channel 4. Mm. Uh, after I'd come back from clubs or whatever. So that associates for me, that's, you know, tea and a joint or, you know, coming down with acid, whatever you do at that time. And it did, because of the demographic of the crowd, I think it did the same thing. So I watched this, you have, then me stumble over to the iPad, press a button, used to give me roses, and an entire Spiegel tent sit down calmly and start singing. (laughs) That's incredible. It's like when they used to play classical music at the sort of rough... Tube stations as people are exiting. I so wonder. Clockwork like, Orange style. Yes, right. Oh, God, that's what it always struck me as as well. So has this taught you, have you learned things about humanity or about society from doing this show? It, I mean, for somebody who is, I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty full on, like, a, I think happy nihilist or, and um, interested misanthrope, maybe. You know, mm. like, I, I'm not naturally social. I, it's kind of given me a bit of faith in humanity to be honest because fundamentally a small group of people if you put them together and reason with them um they're okay there isn't and of course we can all be swayed very easily into bad and i still find bad quite scary fascinating because i mean the thing that gets me at the moment is how fucking greedy are people like i mean what you need Hey Bezos, what do you need? Well, greed is good, isn't it? It's that it's 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 kind of the era for that. <laughs> but I, I don't get it though. It's, it's all like, gone a bit gecko. It's just boring, and uh, it's not even gecko. There's an obscenity to it that's even worse now. 
but but it isn't boring because it's 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 all on Instagram and it's all being flashed in our faces that it's fun fire festival you know things like that it's all it's all fun it's all it's all supermodels frolicking in waves that's what yes. money buys you yes but we all know when something's good really for me that the one bit I find really hard here is that the level of production is so bad that it's not me presenting the show as I would choose to. Now, when I was doing it in the bookshop with Bob, hmm. I had one lighting state. I had the light switch. And that, from a production level point of view, I was ecstatic about. I thought it was fantastic. Loved it. But here, I've got cheap Chinese LEDs, badly programmed and badly operated, in a room that I don't get to control the atmosphere in the front of house and the delivery of these people into these seats. And because of that, I'm robbed of being able to really cuddle them up in an entire experience but i still suck them in with this show and i do yeah I, and yet you've stayed for two years well but this is the thing and this thing i think i i do get a um do you want to break it is that the thing you, you want to just I, want to pre- I want to be able to present it how i'd like to be able to present you know so you just go i want these lights and i want this effect and that effect that would be lovely but but really i think i don't know i think um I think people do know when they've had a genuine experience. I get so many people coming up. You know, I've just lost to someone to cancer. I've just found out I've got cancer. I've just had a this. This has just happened to me. And you just made me feel so much better about myself. And you just this um, mm-hmm. it's just given me such, you know, I've just cried, laughed for the last 90 minutes, whatever it is, which is such a lovely. Yeah, it's incredible. And this is people who, who weren't in any way coming to Vegas for that. No, exactly. But I, what I mean is I think, just trying to think. I think people know when something's good still. Um, just yeah, I agree. Almost an example, almost. Um, because you can, I mean, I don't know, I watched that documentary and I thought, <clears throat> fuck me, you know, salesmen are amazing. Mm. But at mm. the end of the day, you've got to deliver and you've got to deliver on some, no, it's fire up, isn't a good example. There is a, um, well, that's like you look at fringe festivals now, and like they're, they're, so many of them have just gone flashy, and they've gone for the big, you know, the big hitter shows, and that's what's being promoted, and that's you know inevitable. But you get people, you see people come out of those shows, and they, you know, and they're, yeah, they've you know had a good time. They've, yeah, it's fine, you know. They got, they thought they, it was what they thought it was going to be, but it's nothing compared to the reaction you see where people go down to some little underground venue or some uh, pop up space, and there's been something just insane saying that they've never seen the likes of before but i also think there's um that can be done on a grander scale and i do think bates and um halo with leclerc really did it because that mm. wasn't underground you did need to know about it the first year right. or maybe the first couple of weeks but that was in a 350 most beautiful venue i've ever been in <laughs> old school speedleton and they but way before leclerc what they did was they delivered on the user experience they delivered on a hospitality. The first time I walked into the famous was in Adelaide in 2000 or 2002. I can't remember which one. Mm. And I walked in and I walked into the best place in the fucking known universe. <laughs> Every, it was, this was the best place in the world. And that's why it had been put, put here. And Spiegel had, tents are magical. No, Spiegel tents are wooden tents with glass in them. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you walk into a, um, light wood, uh, custom built 800 seater designed for either dinner variety in Germany or some fucking variety producer anywhere else who wants to make 800 seats work and it's built five years ago, then no, that is not walking into the 350 capacity, beautiful dark wood yes. history in its floorboards, famous Spiegel tent. That's what, and the thing that they did was it wasn't just the tent. You had all the memories seeping through the floorboards, but you also had the best front of house staff and backstage crew and lighting and sound and deep Mm. in the world that I had ever experienced looking sharp as all fuck. I mean, they put Melbourne's style on the map forever. Now you just associate it with fucking Spiegel tents Mm. Um, because everybody's just done cheap copies. But there, it was special. I mean, the show was absolutely was special, but there was everything about that place was special because they gave a fucking shit and they paid attention to detail and they did it high, high quality. So I was listening to good time tunes, but instead of the 
17 tunes you hear at every office party. It was just all of them were good. And they jumped around in different genres, and I didn't know all of them, but I felt like they were old friends when they came into my life because of, you know, it, it was just magical. And if you dilute that, you end up with what I think the fringe has become now. And, and this is the thing. I think if you can throw money at a large-scale, pretty colours show with enough expensive doodads, if you can throw money at that for three years, then you will have a show that works. But that's not very interesting to me. And that's not, I think people do have a good time at those shows. But, but why is that what the goal is? The goal should be to make something super beautifully magical. Like Lucy and Bob, like the Spiegel year was gorgeous this year. Mm. The blunderbuss, but it is encumbered by its shape. And Bob's forte is not um, what Stumpy's forte is, which is playing with the space that is in front of you. And so it's wonderful, but now the Spiegel, yeah, you just go, you walk in and you go, oh, I just got a hug. You know, and, and you want, <laughs> and I think people underrate, and they do it very much here as well, they underrate um, how important the environment is, how yeah. much work is done, whatever that means. Like, do you remember Office Party? I do. Yeah, so now Office Party, yeah, it wasn't about giving you a hug and a cuddle, though, was it? So you <laughs> needed to walk in and feel like, oh, it's that room in an office. Oh, yeah. I hate the lights. And that's a beautiful thing to play with. And if you pay attention to detail, then I'm transported. Brilliant. You know, so, yeah, I, I think that's what's bloated out the fringe is it's just a uh, alpha B, gamma, beta, gamma. Just yeah. make money. So, you were, so you're not in any rush to return? Oh, well, but I mean, Edinburgh audience is my favorite audience in the world. And it was like mm. fucking catnip. I got to play at the debating hall i got to play in late live venue for 10 nights which is pretty cool and and the edinburgh audience is just such fun i've got this age lottery <laughs> and so someone oh, like, yeah. i think they were 70 and then someone heckled from the back i didn't hear what it was and gutted found out later someone shouted out um those were the fuckers that voted for brexit <laughs> <laughs> i mean we should wrap this up very soon it's been it's, it's been lovely chatting um i'm glad that you are uh, uh spreading the love and bewilderment out <laughs> in vegas yeah love and confusion to all <laughs> is, is is the plan to, to stay there for the time being or are you uh, planning to move on our plan is to stay here for the foreseeable future there's a bunch of things in i'm just sort of been here a while i need a bit more to do and, and what i mean by that is not to make my workload heavier but it's also you know variety is the spice of life so um i'll have a clearer idea i think in about six months but um yeah I would like to be able to play this around the US. Oh, wow. Yeah. Take it. Uh, take it slightly uh, inland. Mm, yeah. It'd be fascinating, wouldn't it? Yeah. It's always that. I mean, it's, I've, I've only ever visited the coasts and I, yeah, it, it really, it just fascinates me all that in a bit. I've got some mates in uh, Texas who always say, oh, come and play, come and play. Yeah. And I would love to. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? Because, I mean, Bill Hicks and all that came from, there was a good scene mm. in Texas. Because that's the thing that I'm curious about. I keep asking people about this is, where's the thing at the moment? What's the thing? It doesn't seem like it's in music. I can't see it in comedy. It's not in variety. I'm not seeing it in theatre. Not really in movies either. So where's that exciting thing? Uh, it depends what you mean by thing, really. I mean, I suppose, the, sadly, the exciting thing is, is Netflix at the moment, isn't it? It's all in the on the little screens. But then you have those exciting things like Hannah Gadsby, I suppose, like the sort of break, breakout hits um, from things like that that have, that have taken on this whole new life. Like a little scene that's bubbling away, you know, that takes, that sort of furthers the art forms um, and has its little weird moment. And then it's, I don't know. I think I was wondering if maybe it's because actually geopolitics is the thing at the moment. Because <laughs> this is the thing. So I went to this um, show called Outrageous Brunch, fucking 1 p.m. Jesus, that's early for me. To be doing. <laughs> anyway, but it was great, really fun. And they had John D. Domenico on, who is the number one Trump impersonator, who now lives <laughs> in, um, And he was fucking brilliant. And it was really interesting because I realized it was the first time I've watched a Trump impersonator. And also, in some ways, the first time, therefore, I've heard someone just talk, talking like most of the stuff I watch on the telly about the news and things. You know, that guy's voice. And he was current. He was referring to news from, from the day before. Brilliant. Like, oh, maybe that 
you know, not parody exactly. No, it's just, repetition. I mean, we just need Trump on stage chatting on what he said on the news today while people just actually respond. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, thank you very much. I mean, are you how many how many nights a week do you do in Vegas? Five. So Lovely. now there's a saying in Vegas which I love, which it because everybody works in hospitality, yeah, you know, cleaner up, yeah, and uh, it's my Friday, so Sunday is my Friday. That means it's <laughs> weekend right now. Yeah, baby. <laughs> uh, do you know? Uh, do you have an idea of advanced sales, or or do you just go in and go right? You know, it's it's however many people I've got in front of me now. I get the numbers through about an hour before the show, and then it will it maybe go up or down a little bit from that. No, I mean up rather a little bit from that. But so I get a heads up. But people tend to buy on the day. So my advances would be if you, if I looked at my advances in two weeks' time, I'd have a heart attack. Sure. Like, oh my god, we sold five, but you know that's because most of them buy on the day. And what if you're like one final bit? Like what? It's all you've got to be stay focused, as you said. It's all dependent on you. What if you've had a shit day and you go yeah. in? How do you shake off that mood before going it's, in and trying to rouse, you know, two I mean, it's not, warring it's factions? Hard discipline. It's, it's harder with this show than it is doing, like, dinner variety. Like, I think mm. that's the narrative where you're just doing the same fucking thing every day um, for, for, for four months. Um, but if you have a shit day, you've got to put it down. I, had, I remember when I first was wrestling with all this stuff when I got over here, and I'm listening to the things I'm saying. <laughs> She's got one life to live. She might as well live it and enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've got to practice what I preach here. Get you high know. in your own supply. Exactly. So then that's really forced me to have a little look at that. And I was like, well, at least for an hour and a quarter a night, you know, just put yeah. it down as it be. And what I've learned is, you know, I just, I can't walk through it. It cannot phone this in. Can't phone it in. And that, that does make it hard on a hard day. But, um, there's muscle in there now where you just put it down. There's muscle and memory, I suppose, as well, isn't there? Yeah. You can just do it. Yeah. Well, one of these days, I really, really, really want to see this in Vegas. It's one of my favourite things. I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I've I brought countless people along to it, and I'll hopefully continue to do so. And one of these days, I'll, I'll, I'll see in the lights of uh, Vegas. You know, you actually popped up on my Facebook memory things. You remember that time oh, yeah. you did... Adelaide, where there was that dude that just had his arms crossed, frowning the entire show. So that popped up on my feed yesterday. It was hilarious. <laughs> oh, yeah, the big guy. Yeah. <laughs> did you get him in the end? I'm trying to think. I think I got one smile you one, did. once, maybe. That's what I. That's one of my games with myself is because they come in and you'll be like, okay, I need to win over those guys, that one, that one, that one. And by the end, my goal is to have cracked a smile on all of their faces. Yeah, but he became the thing, didn't he? Everyone was then just turning to him and watching the whole room pissing themselves, 99%, and then everyone just turning and looking at this stoic Aussie yeah. old guy. Totally. <laughs> but you did get him. There was one, I can't remember what bit it was, but it was, where it, was it was about him, basically, and there was a split second where I didn't realise it was about him, and then, and I think the arms almost became uncrossed there. <coughs> Beautiful. Almost. <laughs> I know, that's the power you have. <laughs> Uh, well, listen, I'll let you get on with your day and um, I will go and uh, tend to my uh, uh, sniffles. But um, good. Yes, good luck with the bag of germs. And um, you. have fun in LA. And I really, really think Marcel should come over. Um, I think you would get, you would have so much fun here as Marcel. Do you think they'd get it? Uh, well, this is what I mean. No, I, 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 I think they could my. get it certain places but i think <laughs> you get so much fun video of you walking around because the paris is literally opposite the bellagio fountain brilliant <laughs> all right we'll, we'll make it happen yeah <laughs> all right thanks okay. lovely take care darling there she was the one woman powerhouse that is misbehave I say the one woman, she, she of course has her able assistant, Tiffany, uh, with her, uh, the brilliant Brett Fister. Uh, uh, that's, that, loves, uh, that adds a lovely element to the show, actually, of, uh, of, of the two of them uh, dicking about. Uh, I, I remember from the Harriet days, and I imagine that has, uh, has only increased that amount of uh, idiocy. I really recommend you go and see this show if you ever get a chance. I was looking on the website, which is uh, um, uh, misbehavegameshow.com. That's got all the uh, up-and-coming dates on there. And it, there's a brilliant quote on there from the, the Scotsman at Edinburgh Fringe, which simply says, I have never seen an audience behave like this. <laughs> and um, I think it's fair to say, 
yeah, it's it's the most wild I've seen an audience be at fringe festivals for quite some time. Although, as she says, she's not into dragging people up on stage. If people want to just go there and watch the chaos ensue again, absolutely fine, and you will not be picked on. You can just go and enjoy the madness. And of course, we touched briefly on Trump and, and Brexit. How could we not really? Uh, you know, a Brit out in out in the states doing uh, anarchic things. But Amy shows a, a really a timely reminder that out of chaos and division, beautiful things can be achieved as well. You know, the whole uh, fuck it ethos of her show it actually says it's not a destructive nihilism. It's just a way of saying, you know, yeah, we're all human. We're all here for a short time. Make the most of it, but don't be a dick about it. And that's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. And I think this episode, for the first time, we've just about got time for uh, some emails or, or an email, maybe. I, I say we've got time. It's a podcast. I, I'm well aware that I can do as long as I want. But I know that uh, your time is precious, listener, uh, as is all of ours. So I shall, uh, I'll shall. i do one. This is a nice one I received. Uh, it's from Claire. It says, really enjoying the podcast. I love Martin and Trevor. Intend to see the others whenever I get the chance. I too saw Ken Campbell's Pigeon Macbed at the National bagger up uh just to explain many things there uh that this is from the i think yeah the martin sewing podcast where i was talking about uh uh ken campbell the uh wonderful enfant terrible of uh, english theater and he put on i saw it at the national student drama festival uh god what year was that 2000 maybe 99 possibly and uh it was him doing uh, a yeah a pigeon english version of macbeth uh, I, I think um he's, he, he introduced it and said something like well yeah it's all this iambic pentameter gets in the way of it doesn't it really and he, so he's kind of uh he thought, he thought that's what, what was holding shakespeare back and he used the wall one language uh, which was a kind of uh, yeah it's it, pigeon english uh, which was, uh, I think, emanated from the South Pacific, which had a 400-word vocabulary, minimal grammar, and uh, it, so there were, you know, things, uh, when something goes wrong, uh, rather than a huge soliloquy, it was the term bugger up, <laughs> which B-A-G-E-R-A-P, uh, which obviously comes from the English bugger up, uh, I heard the Brits saying it, and that's uh, that's where it came from. So uh, I'm trying to find some other ones that I found on a website here, which is, um, yeah, so <laughs> Duncan exclaiming, oh, horror, horror, horror. <laughs> it's, it becomes bugger up, bugger up, bugger up. <laughs> and uh, Lady Macbeth's line, come you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here, uh, becomes in pigeon, sit and take him me handbag. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, quite, quite something to behold. Uh, it was performed by uh, uh, actors of colour, I should add, as well. It wasn't a bunch of white people doing the accent. But anyway, yeah, so that's lovely. Uh, that's, that brings back fond memories of me. So uh, I, I would love to go and see something like that again. Uh, if anyone has got any recommendations for, for weird and wonderful shows uh, that I should go and see, please send them my way, spiritsofthefringe at gmail.com. Likewise, any guests that you think I, I really should be uh, having on that you'd like to hear more about, uh, then let me know. And also we have the Facebook page and the uh, and Twitter profile as well, Spirits of the Fringe. As I say, I'm now off to LA tomorrow. That's doing an 11-hour flight with an eight-month-old child. Let's see how that goes but i while i'm out there i'm hoping to catch an interview with deanna flasher who does buck kapinski another one of those shows believe it or not <laughs> built almost entirely by and from the audience in front of her so yeah there really is a theme running through these podcasts which may or may not change as the months draw on anyway thanks again for listening i will speak to you next time au revoir